Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, my name's Kristen Fletcher. I'm the Programs and Community Engagement Manager here at the Haley Public Library. Thank you for joining us tonight for a talk called It's All About You. I always like to feature a book that we have in our collections, and tonight the book that I would like to feature is Weeds of the West. Um, it is a grand book that features um, plants that can be problematic throughout the West, including uh, those that are designated as noxious weeds. So if you're interested in learning more about weeds in our area, this is a great book. And I just wanted to start by saying that this um, talk tonight is part of a series that we're partnering with the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. Uh, it's called uh, Wildlife Amongst Us. And it's also a talk in honor of the Earth Day Festival, which is coming up in a couple of days. And I wanted to share uh, briefly a story. Um, a friend of mine sent me an email a couple of days ago, and she wrote, I have been wondering where the yew plants were in my Deerfield neighborhood that killed the elk and the moose this winter. When walking around yesterday, I was shocked to find yew shrubs in someone's front yard and right by their front porch, not even behind a fence hiding in plain sight. After all the information about toxic yew that has been in the media, somehow these yew plants were not recognized, found, or removed. I'm concerned that there may be other homes with yew also. So if you live in the Wood River Valley, you know that for the last several years, um, we've all learned more about how Japanese yew is toxic to wildlife, and even a small amount can kill them. So that's what this program is about tonight, is how to actually identify it and the best ways to remove it. So I'd like to introduce our presenters tonight. Dr. Lynn Kintner has been the lead botanist at the Idaho Department of Fish and Game since 2007. She has more than 30 years of experience in plant research and resource management, including work with the Bureau of Land Management, the US Forest Service, and Wyoming Game and Fish Department. Lynn has also taught botany and biology at Boise State University. She has BS, MS, and PhD degrees in botany from the University of Idaho, University of Wyoming, and Washington State University, respectively. She is a longtime member of the Idaho Native Plant Society and lives in Boise. She will be joined tonight by Kay Draper. Kay has been the Blaine County Noxious Weed Department Support Specialist for about two and a half years. In this capacity, she handles questions from the public about noxious and other weeds, as well as weed inspections and enforcement based on our state code. Kay also chairs the Blaine County Cooperative Weed Management Area Coalition, which is a partnership between landowners, interested organizations, and land managers that approach noxious weed management through partnership and collaboration. So please join me in uh, welcoming both Lynn and Kay. Thank you, Kristen. It's so nice to be back in the Wood River Valley again. I appreciate um, all the interest you all have shown and uh, it's great to, to see you this evening. Um, I'm gonna uh, start with acknowledgements. I wanna acknowledge Kristen here at the Haley Public Library who has put on wonderful educational programs um, in recent years and in the past too for that so many of us have taken advantage of just wonderful programs. Then I want to acknowledge Blaine County Weed and Pest um, and Kay Draper is here with me tonight as Kristen mentioned and also Stephanie Carlson who has uh, with Kay they've put on some excellent programs and done a lot of work uh, put together a brochure with us at Idaho Department of Fish and Game and so we've really enjoyed working with them and appreciated their expertise. We also want to thank Chief Orchard of the Sun Valley Police Department, our, the new uh, police chief there recently promoted and he's helped us with landowner contacts and uh, scouring neighborhoods for you uh, as has John Gilmore at the Valley Club and John's um, in charge of a, a lot of area there and uh, was, has been very helpful. And then lastly, the conservation officers, my colleagues at Idaho Department of Fish and Game have spent a lot of time looking for you or addressing the unfortunate uh, cases in which the animals have died. 
and talking with landowners, homeowners, and of course, many members of the public have helped us. And we've even, I've even seen a number of good articles in the, <coughs> in the Idaho Mountain Express that have helped get the word out. So, <coughs> I'm gonna grab my water bottle. <laughs> Thank you. This is an outline of what we'll be talking about. <coughs> First, we're going to go over the historic and scientific literature related to you. Then we'll talk about wildlife deaths in Idaho. Idaho is really kind of unique when it comes to the youth situation. Then Kay will give us some details on Blaine County, specifics to your area. Um, then we'll go into some of the specifics of the toxicity and how to identify you compared to some of the other things you might see, con other conifers you might see in landscaping around uh, the Wood River Valley. And then lastly, we'll talk about some alternatives for landscaping. If you want to get rid of you or if you're planting new and don't want to use you, we'll talk about some good alternatives for you. A little bit on the historical literature of you. Um, English yew has been recognized as poisonous for over 2,000 years. And this is one of the types of ornamental yew that's found in Idaho. That and it's hybrid with Japanese yew. So there's actually records in the Irish literature from about 300 BC talking about the toxicity, primarily to humans, but they knew it was toxic to animals as well. And then maybe the most famous record, one of the most, is uh, Julius Caesar's um, description or commentary on the Gallic Wars. When they were, when the, uh, when his um, countrymen, he and his countrymen were, I guess, uh, warring or fighting some of the tribes of, from Gaul. And they uh, talked about a, a particular king who actually committed suicide using an extract of yew. So people knew even then that yew was particularly toxic. He was, the king was being overrun in battle and too weary to fight or fly, fly, flight. <laughs> so. Then another really famous record of yew is in the Shakespeare plays. You might remember double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. Does that ring a bell? <laughs> well, the, if you on down in that particular set of lines, there's one line that talks about gall of goat and slips of you slivered in the moon's eclipse. So they knew it was kind of a creepy, creepy thing even then. <laughs> the witches threw the you, slips of you into their cauldron. It was also mentioned in um, King Richard, or uh, Richard II, and Twelfth Night were the other two Shakespeare plays where they talk about you. And in Richard II, they mentioned double fatal you. Does anybody know why it might be referred to as double fatal? No? <laughs> well, aside from the obvious toxicity, it's also used to make long bows, was the traditional bows that was used for war, for hunting in those days. And so you could be used to kill in two ways. That's the double fatal reference. Here's an example of some long bows that might have been used, you know, the times of Robin Hood. And although they might have switched to recurves by Robin Hood, I can't remember. But um, certainly a, a really uh, popular style of bow in many countries for centuries. And you was a very popular wood because it's hard, strong, yet flexible. Also, um, canoe paddles were made of wood. There are other types of tools. Tool handles would be made of, of yew wood. And more recently, in the 60s, it was discovered that um, there's a particular chemical in the Pacific yew, which is native to the Northwest. And that chemical is, uh, was used to derive the cancer drug Taxol. The name Taxol comes from Taxus, the scientific name for you. And Paclitaxel and other types of cancer drugs now are derived from you. Obviously, they're not, uh, the Pacific U actually has very little of the toxin in it per se, so it's a different chemical than the, than the deadly toxin, but, and it's highly refined. There's quite a bit of scientific literature on the toxicity of you. The medical literature is full of incidences of people 
um, eating you, ingesting you accidentally or purposefully, or children who were attracted to the little red berries. They're technically their name is an aural, but um, those little red berries are very enticing, and apparently they taste like cherry jello. So kids, you know, they're probably irresistible to a three-year-old. Unfortunately, the seed inside is really poisonous, and only takes about three to kill a child. So if they if they eat the the fruit with the seed in the middle of it, they can be in big trouble. There are also incidences of pets. For instance, I read in the veterinary literature about a dog that died simply from running around the yard with a yeast stick in its mouth. So it didn't take very much to kill the dog, unfortunately. Uh, even parrots and um, things that you might think, oh, it wouldn't probably bother them because they eat so many different foods in the wild, but it did. Livestock, there are incidences right here in Idaho of cattle and horses dying when someone pruned their yew shrubs in their yard and then threw the clippings over the fence into the horse or cow pasture. So it doesn't take very much. And then lastly, there are cases of zoo animals, kind of the same situation where there might have been, um, zoo, there might have been uh, yew on the grounds of the zoo and when the landscaping crew pruned him up, some fell in the cages with some of the wildlife in the displays, and they were um, poisoned. There are scattered reports of wildlife deaths from you outside of Idaho, not very many. But for example, I found, just in Googling online, I found a case of six elk in, um, 19, er, in 2013 that died in Oregon, and a case of um, mother black bear and three cubs that died in a church parking lot in Pennsylvania. So interestingly, so we've had mule deer die in Idaho from you, but not white-tailed deer so far that, I, that we know of anyway. And white-tails seem to be able to tolerate at least a small amount of the toxin because they eat Canada yew, Canadian yew, which is native to the eastern U.S. and Canada. And it has a, a slightly different toxin in it. So they can metabolize some, and maybe they have other means, such as only eating a small amount at a time. I don't know. I wasn't able to really find good details on that, but um, we do know that whitetails can eat the Canadian yew, which is shown right here. <laughs> and then we do know it's, it's toxic to chickens and other bird species. So you know, if you have chickens in your backyard, you don't want to leave cuttings around or those fruit around. Um, they can often, um, birds will eat the fruit. This is a picture in, in, um, from England where, or actually from Scotland, where the uh, native birds were eating the yew, and they simply fly off, eat the fruit, and spit up the seeds. So they don't, that's how they get around it. Now I'll give a little, little bit of... Um, the local Idaho scene, and then Kay will give us some details of Blaine County. Uh, the problems we've had in Idaho have occurred when the forage is covered. So deep snow, the wildlife come down from the mountains. It's been all big game species that we know about. So moose, uh, mule deer, elk, and pronghorn antelope are the four that we've recorded. And they come down from the, from the mountains and they are around our subdivisions where we've planted this landscaping plant, and often the only green thing sticking above the snow will be our landscape plants. So if they encounter this unfamiliar landscape plant, they sample it, and it doesn't take very much to kill them. So it's, it's kind of like they never, they can't learn or learn from experience, so to speak, usually. This is an example of the, how deep the snow can easily be in, in wildlife's native range, and they might have in the past, um, you know, browsed on the native shrubs. But here's the numbers, at least that we I emphasize that we know of, because who knows how many animals wander off and aren't found, so or or their deaths aren't recognized as a death from you necessarily. Um, it first came to kind of my attention in 2000. 10, 11, the winter of 2010 and 11, when two moose near Alpine, Wyoming died. And that was on, they were actually in Idaho, but near the border there. And then there were two elk in Haley the next winter. And then a few winters later, um, 
Um, a lot of snow that year. There were about 25 elk in the Haley and Blaine County area, the, say the Upper Wood River Valley here. But the next year, that was Snowmageddon year, the winter of 1617, there were over 100 animals that we documented across the state. And I'll show you a map in a minute of the breakdown of those. It's actually quite interesting where they occurred. Then in winter of 1819, there was one mule deer near Rexburg, and then this past winter, we had one moose here and at least 15 elk. The fish and game officers kind of quit counting after that. Um, you know, it takes a lot of time to, to necropsy an animal and figure out exactly what it died of, so uh, we don't know precise numbers, but we know at least 15 that we counted and necropsied. So. Here's what they look like uh, in terms of where the deaths occurred in that winter of 1617. You can see, um, if I can get the pointer to work, you can see, there it is, the antelope, 15 prong, uh, 55 pronghorn in the cemetery at Payette, eight mule deer at a subdivision just on the north edge of Boise in the foothills, and one moose in Haley, and then there were 35 elk or 37 elk scattered across the state from Boise. Uh, point these out. Oops, maybe I will. From Boise to Chalice and um, North Fork, north of Salmon there, and then Ammon and Preston. So really all across the state we had deaths. I think here you probably mostly hear about the, the ones in Blaine County, but you're not alone. So. And so I want to focus in on Blaine County now. Blaine County passed an ordinance in 2016 that prohibited you, prohibited selling or possessing you or planting you. And so we've done, uh, as I mentioned, we've done a brochure with Kay and others at Blaine County Noxious Weed Department. And we held a workshop this past winter where we canvassed some neighborhoods, looked at samples, things like that. And we have the brochures here if you would like on your way out, you're welcome to pick those up. And they're specific to Blaine County. They give details on your ordinance and where you can dispose of you. And then uh, Stacy Carlson, who I mentioned, held a, held a U town hall, a virtual town hall, uh, a few weeks ago, in which Kay and my colleague Terry Thompson spoke, and I, and we talked about some of the same material here, but we have a little more time to go into it, and we have samples here tonight. So I'm going to turn it over to Kay and let her give you more details. Hi, good evening. Thanks, Lynn. Um, so what we've done here in Blaine County, as soon as we heard from Fish and Game this year about the deaths um, near the Valley Club area and then heading up into the Ketchum area, um, we took major steps with Fish and Game and it was a, a wonderful collaboration between the two Blaine County Noxious Weeds, Blaine County Outreach and Education, which is Stephanie Carlson, and myself and with Noxious Weeds, and then Lynn and Terry, and then I think we had seven fish and game officers that joined us as we went around, which actually made quite the presence in the neighborhoods, <laughs> <laughs> in, their, in their dress up and everything. Um, they look quite official, and it was nice to have them along. Um, we, during that time, that day, we actually found, I uh, believe, four homes with you plant, uh, contacted the you, the homeowners, and they immediately removed the U's. They were very fast to respond. Since then, we've been doing social media posts, we've been continually working with Lynn and Terry from Fishing Game and some of the officers as well. I'd like to recognize Rob Beck here in the community. He is, um, he takes down trees and arborist and um, he has been essential to helping us remove yew plants throughout the valley and his quick response has been wonderful. Um, we've also been reaching out to the HOAs and landowners directly. Um, we've sent letters out to the neighboring areas where the uh, deaths had occurred. Um, so I would say over 200 letters have gone out throughout the valley. 
We have sent out blast emails to the HOAs, the landscape companies, the uh, property management companies. So a lot of effort w between Fish and Game and Blaine County has gone into this. Um, the identification uh, with Lynn and the education has been essential, so I'm super excited to have her here tonight. Um, before I had that time with Lynn, I had a really hard time identifying you um, because it's very similar to other plants and other sp spruces, pines, lots of other evergreens. So without Lynn's expertise and Fish and Game on board, uh, we would have not made the progress that we have made throughout the valley. We, speaking of the officers that we went around into the neighborhoods that was throughout the Valley Club, Elkhorn area, Bigwood Golf Course, and Haley area. Um, since we did that, we made the brochure, which we, like Lynn said, we have here tonight for you. And it has been essential too to get out the word because of the pictures in it We've, uh, I think it r very well identifies. I've actually had several people come into my office. We've had lovely conversations and they've gone home and I've been able to identify that they do not have you, so yay. Um, but on the other hand, we have identified four homes in the Deerfield area and we're continually working with these homeowners. Two of them have been very quick to respond and I'm still working with two to get them the other ones removed um, because we did, I believe, have three to four elk die in that area. So it's very important um, if you know of somebody that has a U plant or you think they might have a U plant, reach out to me. That information is kept confidential. Um, you can go on our website and report it on our report a weed link and um, that will not go like regular noxious weeds and be identified on the public site where you can go and see where all of our weeds have been identified. But it will um, let me know, I can reach out to the property owner, I can go and identify it, make sure that's what it is, make sure it's not what it is, and um, help the landowner get in touch with the correct people to get them removed. Our goal is to remove as many as these we can this summer um, so next winter we don't see the same problems that we've had this year. So Lynn, I'm going to turn it back over to you and thank you for your time and thanks for being here. Thank you Kay, that was a great summary and uh, nice to know what you all are doing working with the landowners and the homeowners. Yeah. Well now we'll talk a little bit about the toxin that's in these ornamental yews. And there's actually several species, so I'll talk about the species a little bit later, but first I want to give you the overarching picture because all of these um, ornamental, what we call ornamental use, everything sold in the nursery, those are all toxic, so we can treat them as a group. <clears throat> and all parts of the U are toxic except that red fruit. The seed in the middle of the fruit's toxic, the stems, the root, in fact, I recently read a study where um, researchers had cut down a yew, or a series of yews, and then sampled a poison in the, yew, in the roots that were left seven years later, and it was essentially as, as, as high as the fresh plant. Because it's very hard wood, very slow to decay, and it's not, the toxin isn't water soluble, particularly. So, just sat there in the ground for seven years. So, um, the chemical in it is an, is an alkaloid, a toxic alkaloid, termed taxine. It was actually discovered in the mid-1800s. A chemist isolated that alkaloid. Canadian U, as I mentioned, has a slightly different chemical, taxanine, but same effect. Oh, I, I'll show, I'll talk about how it affects, <coughs> how it affects animals. Excuse me. <clears throat> and the next slide is, uh, there's two dead animals on it. So if you don't want to see it, you can just close your eyes for about 20 seconds and then I'll tell you when we're past that slide. <clears throat> um, the poison acts really quickly and these animals you can see, they just 
basically dropped in place. The, an the pronghorn here has a little bit of bleeding coming from its mouth, but other than that, it literally just dropped. The elk had no sign like that. They just drop in place. Sometimes there's a little bit of um, uh, convulsions and labored breathing, but death follows rapidly from heart attack. So the first symptom, all right, we're off the dead animal pictures now if you have your eyes closed. <laughs> the first symptom is, is often death, with wildlife especially. With a person or a dog that you're close to or something like that, you know, you may have a little, little more time, a little more, aware, um, little more um, awareness or alert to try and get him to medical attention immediately, but uh, not necessarily. On the left here is a kitchen scale with a cup of yew leaves. This is in my kitchen. And that is enough to kill a person right there. Or a small elk, um, calf, it could be killed. A calf elk or a, even a bovine calf, a small calf could be killed by only a cup of yew leaves. When we find the yew needles in the rumen, they often aren't even very much digested, just a little bit chewed, and they'll be near the top of the rumen, so they don't make it very far into the digestive system before the animal dies. For larger animals, say a larger elk um, or a bovine cow, uh, as opposed to a cow elk, um, the, it might take nine, nine or ten cups, but still not a lot, still less than one percent of their body weight. And the same for a horse. Cattle, it takes a little more you to kill a uh, bovine cow than a horse. And there are four species of ewe and their hybrids that we find in the ornamental um, landscaping. The, uh, all of them, as I mentioned, are poisonous, and the English ewe is one of the most poisonous in the world, poisonous plants known in the world, and the Japanese ewe is even more poisonous. And that's typically what's in Idaho. The Japanese yew or its hybrid with the English yew are very common here. I saw an English yew in a, in a nursery in Boise the other day where they haven't been quite as quick to uh, try and get rid of them. The Chinese yew and the Canadian yew are also sold, but they're just not as common. There are many types of you for sale. They won't necessarily give one of the four species names that I'm going to show you here in a second. But um, so they might be called something like dwarf you or hicks you or gold you, Irish you. But no matter what the varietal name, it's still one of those types, and it's still extremely toxic. We'll start with Japanese you, which I meant, mentioned was the most common in Idaho. Taxus cuspidata is a scientific name, and cuspidata refers to the little point on the end of the needles that we'll see in a minute that make, that's distinctive for you. It's typically a shrub or small tree, and there are so many different varieties, you can't really generalize on a shape or a particular size or height because they're just all, all kinds, all shapes and sizes, as you'll see here in a minute. Some of the Japanese you can be 40 feet tall, but I haven't seen that in Idaho. So it would be uncommon here. Then the English U, it's native not only to England, but across Eurasia. It's sometimes called the European U, Taxus baccata. And it's uh, many, many varieties also planted. It's typically more often planted as a tree. And it's a very common tree in cemeteries in Europe. They, it was a, actually a revered tree. They recognized the poison, or the power, I guess, of the tree and the poison in the tree. And um, it was uh, kind of a, a special or holy tree for them, for people throughout history. It can be a little bit bigger than the Japanese yew, 50 feet tall. The Chinese yew, Taxus chinensis, is native to Asia. And as I said, it's, it's not so common in Idaho, but all these different varieties, it's really hard to tell. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if there's some hybrids with Chinese yew that are in I Idaho. Shrub or small tree. And then the Canadian yew. It's a low-growing shrub. Might be about this high. And I do wonder about some of the shrubs that Kay and I found here. 
that were kind of low to the ground and were open and spreading. We found several in February when we were going around <laughs> trying to find the elk hot spots, unfortunately. But, um, and I, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if those are some kind of hybrid with the Canadian U. Then the Pacific U, this is our native U in Idaho. It doesn't grow in your county, unfortunately, because they're really cool trees. They have this reddish bark, and the, the young trees, this is a little bit older trunk here, you can see some of the red, but the young trees are kind of almost brick red, their whole uh, trunk is. And they look very much like, the, the needles look very much like the U's that are planted in people's yards. But they have only traces of the toxin. Unfortunately, they're not used in landscaping because they're very high water use. So they grow like Washington and Adams County and on north, kind of very, especially the northern part of the state, which has a lot more moisture. And they have, um, typically have their roots right close to the edge of the stream. If not right, I almost said right in the stream, but it, they could be 20 feet back, but very moist areas. So not really practical for our arid climate here in terms of landscape plants. And they're important forage for moose, <clears throat> elk, and deer. And they were also where the Taxol drug was first isolated that I mentioned. Many of the ewes that are um, in people's landscapes, I mean, there's just so many different shapes it's hard to generalize. Some are very rangy like this, especially if they haven't been pruned but they are uh, very amenable to pruning. So sometimes you'll see them cut into more um, familiar shapes, like little balls or columns. Sometimes they'll be almost like a pillar. <laughs> it can be difficult to get an eye for the form because it has so many different forms. <laughs> this one on the left is about five feet tall and this one on the right is probably closer to 12 or 15 feet tall it's just a big difference in a big variation in the, in the um, way they're shaped and how big they grow this is one that Kay and I spotted in Sun Valley I think this one was and it uh, I mentioned about the Canadian U being more rangy and open, and that's what this seemed to be too. I mean, we can only see part of it sticking out through the snow, but nothing like the previous slide I showed you where the plants were very pruned. And then in the same area, there was a, a little bit of U peeking out from under the snow, and it was only about that tall. So lots of different variation in form. Do you have flat needles, whichever species or variety you're looking at, they all have flat needles that are about an inch long, and they have this abrupt point on the tip that's termed a cusp. This little point, it's not a straight-sided point, it swoops in. See how that swoops in there? And that's the key. Because I'll show you other evergreens, but none of them have that swooped inside. And they're also arranged, sometimes they're arranged around the stem, and sometimes they're more flat along the stem. It just depends on the species and variety. So it's hard to generalize that. But whichever leaf arrangement and whichever overall shape you have, if you see that swooped in point, you know you have a U. And so we have some specimens that Kay's very kindly gonna hold up for the camera and then show to you all. Um, yeah, and so you can see I mentioned that sometimes they're uh, spiraled around the stem, which this is an example of. And when it comes by and you're looking at it up close, you'll be able to see that little swooped in point. Another feature is that they have a dark green top and a light green bottom. So sometimes the top looks more yellowish or bluish, but there's still an obvious darker side on top and lighter green on the bottom. And then another thing about the U, I mentioned the red orals or the fruit. Is this the male U? Oh yeah, great. Um, so I just showed a female U, and, the, and this is a male U. They actually have male and female on different plants. Some plants do that, not all, but. 
And so in this case, there are little um, gold pollen cones. These are actually termed male cones, and they put out the pollen. And so when you look for a U, you won't necessarily see the red aurals, the red fruits, because you might be looking at a male plant, or you might be looking at a sterile hybrid plant, <laughs> hybrid plant but you will still see the same shaped needles regardless. So, great, thank you. And uh, when you pass these around, if you want to look up close, there is a, a little, um, a couple dried up female aurals in the bottom here of this female plant. They're hard to find this time of year. I had to look quite a bit till I, till I found a few. Pretty quickly, they'll look more like acorns. You know, the new green ones forming, they look more like acorns than this typical yew fruit. So. Here's another look at one that's a yew that's a little more flat in the needle arrangement. And some are even more flat than this, almost like the, somebody's parted their hair or something and they're perfectly flat. And here you can see the light green on the bottom very well and then the dark green tops, light green bottoms. If you see a fruit with an opening, it looks maybe like a blueberry or, or a teeny plum or something, but it differs in that it has this opening here and you can see a dark seed inside. That's a clue. And here's the aural when it's dried up in the winter. So they might uh, be fresh on the plant, say in July or August, and then they just hang on the plant all winter long until they drop off about this time of year. And so sometimes you can search around, and if you have a female plant, you'll find these dried up fruits, but you can still see the dark seed inside. And then later, maybe in June, May or June, you'll see the new fruits forming. This is gonna be the seed, and this will be the aural growing down here. So they, uh, the birds would have dispersed, you know, kind of the, the yew would have used birds as dispersers for its seed, and so they don't really need a red fruit while the seed is just beginning, beginning to form. So that's what's going on there. Then here's a close-up look at the male cones, the pollen cones. A lot of people don't realize, but all conifers have female cones and male cones, and the male cones produce the pollen, and the female cones end up producing the seed. So. This was a couple months ago that I took this picture, and so now these little pollen cones have opened up, and this, the sample that Kay was showing has the opened pollen cones. Pretty quickly, those will fall off, and you won't be able to see those. But to refresh your memory, if you see arls or cones or not, as long as you see these pointed cusps, this uniquely pointed tips, you'll know you have a U. Now we'll go over some of the look-alikes. The first one is a spruce, and it has, uh, there's a, particularly these dwarf Alberta spruce. I stopped and looked at a lot of those in people's yards, thinking they were U. But because they're pruned the same way. This is a spruce on a standard. It's on a little kind of funny little trunk there, shaved into a, into a ball. And it also looks like you from a distance. But when you look at the needles up close, you'll see they're pointed on the end. But they don't have that cusp and they're not flat. They're actually square in cross section. So if you try to shake hands with a spruce, it hurts. We say sharp square spruce when you're shaking hands with it. So that'll help you maybe remember. The U needles, um, even though they're pointed, they're softer. Oh, great. And Kay's got the, the spruce um, sample here. This particular one's probably a blue spruce. Some spruce have bluish needles, and some have more dark green or even gold needles. And you can tell that you have to look very closely at the end, but you can see the pointed tips. It hurts when you touch it. <laughs> and um, they're very stiff. They don't flex the way the U needles do. They're also thinner. 
And the U needles are probably twice this thick because they're flat. So if you were to shave these or cut it in half with the razor, you know, lengthwise, you'd see it square in cross section. So, thank you. And I do also have some spruce cones here. You may not realize, but spruce and fir and some of the other um, conifers I'll show you, they all produce cones. Not, and they're not necessarily pine cones. They, they're spruce cones. Yes, that's great. They're still a woody cone. They're very different from what we saw on the U. And they're, they're much closer to a pine cone, actually. They're more closely related to pines. And in this case of the spruce, the cone scales are very papery. They're not nearly as heavy as a pine cone, which we'll see in a minute. So if you see any kind of woody cone, it's not a U. Another look-alike is a fir, mm -hmm. and uh, there are true firs, and then there's Douglas fir, and I'll show you both of those. They're, they're uh, in the same family, but not the same genus. The firs have rounded tips, so I guess I'll show up here. You can see they're, they're actually almost flat on the tip, and the leaves are flat like you. So if I were to shake hands with a fir tree, it, it doesn't hurt at all. We say flat, friendly fir when we're trying to remember the difference between the spruces and others. So the, the flat friendly firs make them great Christmas trees because they don't hurt when you put the lights on. So my parents used to give us a cedar tree for Christmas that they cut off the edge of the fields. Those things hurt. <laughs> These are, I love it, love it now when we can get firs for Christmas. And you'll see that the needles kind of swoop up from the bottom. That's another trait of the fir. But the tips are just clearly not a cusp or a point in the way that the U needles are. You won't find uh, cones on firs in general because they fall off. They, they break up and, and just disintegrate. Sometimes you'll see the little, um, the middle of the cone sticking, looking like a candlestick at the top of the fir tree, but we don't have any fir cones to show you. So thanks for that one. Another look-alike, which I don't have a sample for, is hemlock. And they are occasionally planted. They're probably planted more up here because they're much more uh, cold tolerant. They're not planted much in Boise. But I see them occasionally around town, such as this tree on the left. It's a hemlock tree there. And it's not related to poison hemlock. They have the same name because they have a similar smell. At least whoever first named them thought they had a similar smell. This is a totally different family than poison hemlock, which is in the carrot family, and this is in the pine family. So, but hemlock does have um, needles that are about as long as U needles, and they can be arranged on the stem in the same way, but they have rounded tips. They don't have that point, and they also have little teeny hemlock cones, little woody cones. They're only about um, three quarters of an inch long kind of like mini pine cones. So if you see these little cones, it's not a U. And there you can see the male pollen cones of the hemlock, too. There. Now we'll look at pines, a couple different types, especially mugo pines. These are native to Switzerland. They're a low-growing pine. Well, they can grow taller than that, but people often prune them to low um, just a low form in the same way that you are pruned. And so sometimes from a distance, I'll see a, see a hedge of mugo pines and think I'm looking at a hedge view until I jump out and, and look at them. And we do have some mugo pines and some other pines. I think the mugo's in the bottom of the bag there, right here, right here, here yep. And then that's just a different species of pine that I'll show you. Um, these are, any of these look-alikes will be a great substitute if you want to plant something else other than you in your yard. And mugo pines are a nice short one. Um, they're not native, you know, we have some, uh, nor, nor are the you, as I mentioned, but they're still a, an attractive evergreen shrub that can be pruned in a similar way. And one thing about pines, the needles are much longer than the you. The mugo pine has some of the shorter needles of all the pines that I see planted in landscaping around here or out in the wild even. Um, but they, all pines have their needles in bunches or clusters. So if we were to look right where the, 
base of the plant. I don't know how, if you can probably, it's probably a little far, stretched to see this from the camera, but right at the base of the needle where the needles join the stem, there'll be a group of pine needles there. So, and they're also not flat in cross section. They're closer to square or sometimes they're kind of pie shaped. Like if you mash three of those together in a bunch, they'll look like the pie's been cut in three pieces. So, okay. Um, as I mentioned, other pines typically have longer needles. Let's see if I have another pine. Um, bristle cone is one that I've seen planted around here. It's a really unique looking pine tree. <laughs> Very different than, say, the native ponderosa pines. This is a scotch pine that was growing in a parking lot. And it has needles that are what, probably four or five inches long, so markedly longer than you. They're still in bunches. And generally, if you look around on the ground, you can find some woody pine cones somewhere. So, thanks. Yeah, if you have the cone, that'd be great. Oh, good. Yeah. So that's what we think of as a typical pine cone. Some, you know, depending on the species, they might be a little smaller than that, all the way up to, oh, more than a foot long, depending on the type of, type of tree you're looking at. There's a pine in California that has a cone that's more than a foot long. But thanks. That's a great one. The bristlecone pines are a really ancient type of pine. They, they are very long-lived trees, and they're they look like a bottle brush because the, of the way the needles are arranged on the stem. But I've seen these growing around the Wood River Valley here. Then the junipers. There are many species of junipers. Probably any form you want, you can find. Tall and columnar, short and squatty, uh, low-growing ground covers, just all different shapes and sizes. So this is the natural height of this particular variety of juniper, only oh, less than a foot. And then here's one that's about three feet tall, and then this one was six feet or more. So they're also amenable to pruning. They would be a good substitute for you. And there are some native junipers in Idaho. OK, great. So this is a, um, this, these juniper needles are sticky. Remember I mentioned the cedar trees at my they were technically red cedars, and they were in the juniper genus um, that my parents used to give us for Christmas trees. And these young needles are very sharp and short, so they hurt, okay. And then there's two other kinds of juniper that you might encounter. Oh, that shows those needles better. Yeah, that's a great one. So here's a juniper that has a little bit more open um, needle-like needle -like leaves, so you might be able to see those better. And they are... Um, the young leaves typically, but there's some varieties where the whole plant has these needle-like leaves. Then there are other junipers. Yeah, that's a great one. They're also called red cedars. Eastern red cedar is very popularly planted around southern Idaho. And they have, most of their needles are, um, or leaves are scale-like. They shingle one over the other. And so you end up seeing what looks like a needle but it's actually a series of scales close together. And this particular one is, is from a male juniper, and it, you can see the little male pollen cones right there just beginning to develop. So, thanks. And then there's a female juniper as well. I don't think, I can't remember if I have a picture of it. Oh yeah, there we go. So the, the male, I mentioned the um, female has fruits that are round, bluish, yeah, fruits. They're not open on the end. These are technically modified cones as well, like the aurels on the U, but they're not open and they're never red, not at any stage of their development. So you won't, I think if you have a juniper in your yard, you won't mistake it for you when you see those scale-like leaves in the, the fruit. At least if you have the female juniper, that's pretty obvious. <laughs> Thanks for those, okay. Um, oh, and this, uh, in this slide, you can see the shingling or overlapping of the scales better, probably, than you could on camera. So, and then the more needle-like leaves of the young stems on the left here. One of the last look-alikes, I don't think I have too many more after this, one or two more, um, is the arborvitae, uh, which translates to tree of life. 
And they also have scale-like leaves. In the upper right here, you can see the little scales overlapping each other. And they can be small shrubs, or very commonly, if they haven't been pruned, they'll be taller than a house. Right there. So here's the arborvitae samples. And you can, they look almost ferny, the leaves do, with the, the way the scales are arranged. Okay, thanks for that one. And I think I have a few arborvitae cones also that we can see. They have what look like miniature pine cones as well. So, um, did you find some? Oh, great, great. So, very small. Nothing like the orals of a U. So, if you have an arborvitae in your yard, between those little wooden cones and, or woody cones and the scale like leaves, you won't mistake them. And then there are a couple. Um, oh, I want to show one more. Yeah, let's show the larch. I guess I didn't put it in the slide program, but occasionally around here we see larch trees. They're in the pine family, but they lose their needles in the fall every year. And so this is a branch from the winter uh, that would be covered in gold needles in the fall and green needles, well, late spring and summer. They have little woody cones as well. They look a lot like pine trees. They're relative of the pine. Um, but you won't see, on you, you won't see a yew that, in general, unless something's wrong with it, I've never seen a yew lose its needles in this way, even a sick one. And the larch also has the needles on little pegs. So even without the needles, you'll see these little pegs, and you'll know that it's not a yew. Thank you. That's great. For that. Then there are two others that don't uh, grow in Idaho. They aren't used in Idaho landscapes because they're from warmer climates, so they can't really take the cold here anywhere in Idaho. But they are online a lot. And so if you're searching, for you online, so you can try and identify it, you're going to probably pull up these other two types of you, which are really in a completely different family, not even that closely related. But, uh, well, they're, I guess they're somewhat closely related. But um, completely different plant anyway, certainly different genus. And one is actually called Japanese plum you, <laughs> to make things really confusing with Japanese you. They're called plum yous because their fruits are kind of like little plums. They're not open on the end. So if you're looking for how to identify a U online or you're looking for plants to buy, don't get confused. I mean, they're not sold around here, but if you were going to order something online, you might be confused. So the, um, we talk about hardiness zones. This plant's six to nine. That's going to be at most Boise, but generally much warmer than Boise. Nine's probably South Carolina and Florida, that kind of climate. And up here in the Wood River Valley, you're no more than a five, four or five, depending on talk to. The needles are a bit longer. They are flat, like the U, which is probably why they're called Plum U, when they share that name. And then they are arranged more in a V pattern on the branches there. So if you go to Florida, maybe you can look for Plum U. They're kind of, kind of a cool looking plant. And there's one that is actually called Japanese yew or yew pine. And at one point, I'm sure, you know, botanists kind of had to sort that all out, but they're also in a different genus, Podocarpus. Some people use the scientific name Podocarpus when they refer to it horticulturally as well. These are evergreen trees or shrubs, also in, used in the south, southern U.S., but not in Idaho. And they have much longer needles, four inches long. I'd be more likely to, include, uh, to confuse that with a pine than with a yew. Well, we're getting down to the last uh, section of our talk here, and this is how to get rid of yew, how to address it if you have it. First thing, if you're in Blaine County, definitely need to cut it down and dispose of it in a covered landfill. After my examples, you probably know you shouldn't be throwing it over the neighbor's fence so, for their dog or their horse. Um, the dried branches, dead branches, it doesn't matter. Just like the roots, it doesn't matter how old they are, they are still toxic. So we don't put them in a compost pile where a dog might get to them later. And the stump, 
can re-sprout. So the main, the main stump and the main part of the roots. Now all the little root fibers way out on the end, I don't think they would bother you, but if you don't dig the stump out, you're gonna have sprouts coming back, or if you don't treat it with herbicide. You can also treat it with herbicide. If you do have sprouts coming back, you can just snip them off, but you need to be aware of what that is. You know, you might not be thinking about it, you think, oh, the U's gone, and not keep an eye out for the new sprouts. So be aware of that. And be diligent in cleaning up, because especially in the winter, you know, when the elk don't have much to eat, they could definitely come, off, come along and lap up some of these little crumbs that are left, and that would be enough to kill them. So. In other places where they aren't a hazard, you know, where they don't have wildlife coming into subdivisions and perhaps they aren't worried about their dog or their neighbor's, ho neighbor's horse, um, they can be covered. Or in a pinch, if for some reason you couldn't cut it down, you could cover it with a tarp or some burlap for a while and then cut it down as soon as you can. But here, with all the trouble we've had, it's best to just get rid of them immediately. And we're very appreciative of Rob Beck or others who have acted quickly um, to help get rid of those. There are different kinds of commercial covers that you can buy. Oops, I went too fast here. Commercial covers that you can buy to cover up shrubs in general to protect them in the winter. And so that could be used if you wanted to cover a U. This is just burlap here tied around. <clears throat> and then at times I'm asked about whether you can be invasive. These ornamental species, can they escape like other noxious weeds? And in Idaho, we have not seen that. There's a few places in the US where the English U has spread. For example, over in Western Washington and New York and Pennsylvania, a little bit in Virginia, the light blue counties are where the U has been documented spreading in the wild. So the birds spread the seed or spreads other ways and um, they can actually establish there, but it's too dry here in our climate apparently. Their native climate is much moister climate there. And then the Japanese U has spread in a few places also, uh, Ohio, Kentucky, Pennsylvania, et cetera, on up through New England, a little bit in Michigan there. So few locations, but again, not a problem in Idaho, thank goodness. I'll give you a few ideas of what to plant in place of U. Any of these lookalikes could be planted. Most of the lookalikes I mentioned are the, the ones that are in the horticulture trade are non-natives, but there's still, a, you know, there's still a conifer that would be, give you winter color, so to speak, and, and some winter structure. I think that's part of why you are so attractive to people because they're evergreen. So any local nursery can provide you with a lot of alternative evergreens for your, for your yard or your business. And I just, this is just one in Boise that I strolled into and, you know, they had a whole bunch of different kinds, a bunch of different junipers, some of the cypress, which is related to arborvitae, or just perhaps sometimes people give arborvitae the name cypress. So lots of options. Um, there are also many native species. There aren't very many natives that people use in landscaping that are evergreen, but there are a few like Oregon grape, and um, maybe fern bush, it kind of stays green. It's down at Craters of the Moon. I would expect it to grow here, to be fine here. Uh, and then there are others that have other kinds of winter interest. For example, the, the, um, uh, the red twig dogwood has these nice red twigs. And then there are some that just have the arching branches, you know, nice winter form. That might be the golden currant or the syringa or the elderberry, especially elderberry. It has kind of these cool branches that look almost like bamboo coming up. So there are many others that hopefully the local landscapers here could help you if you wanted to plant native shrubs. They could help you find some that would fit your eye and your, your landscape design. So lots of good alternatives. For more information, I'd encourage you to check out the Idaho Department of Fish and Game website. We have some basic information on you here. It covers some of the things we've talked about tonight, and it has more native species listed that you might consider. And also uh, Blaine County for 
specific information on how and where to dispose of you or things like that, Blaine County website is great as well. They have different information than we do and it's really helpful for the um, local community. And with that, I think uh, we'll wrap it up and Kay and I, or at least wrap up the formal presentation and Kay and I are happy to take any questions you all have. <laughs> any questions? I have a question um, and you may need to repeat it. Okay. Um, That's a great question. So Kristen asked if the yew plant is particularly palatable to these animals. Um, we only have problems in the winter, so I think they're not seeking it out in the summer, even though we know they're in town in the summer, so it must be not one of their favorites. Uh, but we also see that the animals that are eating it are in good health otherwise. You know, they have uh, good fat deposits, good bone marrow situation, so they're not in starvation situations necessarily. They're choosing it over perhaps some of the other things that are sticking up above the snow. So it must be middle of the road for him, I would say. Okay. When you were talking about disposing of it, what's a cover of landfill? Uh, what are the options here? It, it's, just, it's a landfill where the, the question? yes, that's a great question. The question is what, uh, what did I mean when I said covered landfill? So that would be something where it's going to be covered, not composted. It's going to be covered and, and, or not sit out in the open, like not just thrown in an in a open brush pile in the backyard or the back 40 or something like that. What are the options here for people? So our situation here in Blaine County with Ohio Gulch, um, you would need to bag it and take it up to the uh, landfill. We don't want it going into our compost piles um, and we don't want it laying out within just the trash area either. So um, birds can pick it up. I'm sure deer do wander down in that area at night. Um, so we want to make sure that it's concealed and covered up. And I'll mention again, since we're on the topic, um, the cleanup around what has been cut down is super important. Um, the sites that I've gone to revisit and make sure that it was cut down appropriately. There's still lots of little twigs laying around and we really need to rake those up and get those bagged up as well. As the snow melts, did you see more you emerging where people thought they'd gotten rid of it? Yeah, no we actually, Rob has gone back a couple different times to clean up stumps or clean up sprigs or a, a whole new bush has emerged as the snow has melted. So, um, yeah, that, that's definite. Yeah. Another question? Yeah, how, let's say I'm a homeowner, I realize that I've got you in my house, and I take my pruning shears and put my gloves on and prune it. Should I, like, throw those gloves away? Should I clean the pruners? Mm. How careful should I be for myself or anybody who might be using that equipment? Ah. So the question was how uh, careful do we have to be when we're using gloves and pruning shears, pruning equipment? Do we have to clean it? Uh, I have never read in the medical literature of anyone getting poisoned through skin, even directly skin contact. Um, at the same time, we did, you know, we know about the you extract that Julius Caesar told about the king drinking, so I wouldn't want to have a lot of juice on my hands. I would try to keep it off my hands for sure. I don't think I'd necessarily throw away my gloves. I just wouldn't eat my sandwich with them. So. <laughs> <laughs> what else about it? I guess, yeah, I think you'd be okay there, but uh, dil definitely diligent in picking up the scraps, as Kay said. So. One thing I'd like to mention before we finish up today, the message that Blaine County is trying to put out about you and trying to clean up our valley and get rid of it is not because we want to shame anybody or call anybody out on having you plant. Like I said earlier, yews are really difficult to identify. And there were several yew plants planted in the valley 20 years ago when developments, developments were happening. Um, so, 
you might have a U-plan in your yard and know nothing about it. And we just want, our concern is for the wildlife, of course. Um, I would hate to see somebody's dog pick up a branch and eat it and you lose your pup. It would be a very sad occasion. And even more so, a toddler pick a berry because the red berries are so enticing and get that seed that's inside the berry. Um, I am blown away that only three seeds could kill a child. Um, so that's, that's the message that we're trying to get across to our homeowners here is that we just want to get rid of these so we don't keep running into these problems and we never see that happen yeah. to a human or a dog or pet for sure. Thanks. Are there other questions? Or, okay. Great. I think we're... That's great. Yeah, good information. Thanks, everybody. Um, thanks a lot, Lynn and Kay, for joining us tonight. And, and as I mentioned earlier, this will be posted onto our website. It's live streamed tonight, but it'll be posted on our website. So if you know of anybody who's like wondering about this uh, and want to share that information, um, I should be able to post it by Monday. Uh, so you're welcome to share it widely. Um, I'll share it with you folks, too, if there are other ways that um, you can distribute that, uh, your talk. So um, thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Kristen. Thanks, Kristen. <laughs> <laughs>